This uh, morning I got a scripture that I want to read. It's from Psalm chapter 34, verses 1 through 4. It says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Almighty the Lord with me and exalt his name and let us exalt his name together. I like this scripture here. It says, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Our family's been praying about a situation we've been seeking the Lord on and we got confirmation of that blessing this week. So if you've got a need, just seek the Lord. Just seek, keep seeking the Lord and he will answer it. He'll answer your prayer. He'll answer what you're seeking for. If you would, just stand with us. We want to go to the Lord in prayer. We have our prayer requests. Let's remember all the ones on the uh, Sister Diane samples. Good to see her here in service this morning. Amen. Sister Florence Mitchell, let's continue to remember her in our prayers. And then we have all the uh, ones of family and friends. Let's, let's remember each and every one of these needs. And also, let's remember, uh, I believe it's the Davis family. Let's remember them in our prayers also going through a, a life-changing devastation. But let's just lift this family up in our prayers that God uh, a touch and be there and comfort them. If you have a need, just lift your hand. God knows all about it. You know, that's the good thing about God is we don't have to, we don't have to tell, like, if I want to, if I've got a need I want Billy to pray about, I've got to tell him what it is. God, you don't have to do that. God already knows that need, and he knows what you need for. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, and we thank you, dear God, this morning. We thank you for your blessings. Dear God, we thank you for each and every blessing that you've given us, dear God. And we pray this morning, dear God, that you would just touch and bless each and every need. Each and every one that's on the screen, dear God, we pray for blessings upon them. We pray, dear God, that you would touch those, dear God, that's lifted their hand this morning, dear God, with a need in their life. Pray that you would just minister to them, those that's lost loved ones. Dear God, I pray you would comfort them today, dear God, that you would just reach down your hand upon them and bless them. Dear God, I pray for this service this morning. Dear God, that we would just lift up your, our hands, dear God, and we would worship you. Dear God, as only you deserve to be glorified. You all deserve to be honored, dear God. I pray that you would just touch us, dear God, and we thank you for each and everything that you've done for us, and we'll give you honor and praise and glory for it all. And everybody says, amen and amen. Who's glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. Who's ready to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? We're going to throw it back this morning with an old song, but it is one of my favorites. And I know all of you will enjoy it and worship along with us. Ready? What can wash away my sin?
in my life. You know, Sister Kyla, not too long ago, when you were laying in those hospital beds and all those different medical treatments and procedures, look what the Lord has done. Amen. How many of you can say God has done something miraculous in my body? Amen. And I am so thankful that we serve a God that we can trust in because he never fails. Amen. Hallelujah. Just worship with us.
you. Father, we just thank you in this place. Lord, we just give you a hand clap of praise all over this house today because you are worthy of all the praise. God, we exalt you in this house today. And Father, we just thank you, Lord, that we have the breath in our lungs to be able to come in this house. Lord, to worship you, to praise your holy and mighty name, Father. And God, I just pray that you would have your way. Lord, convict our hearts today, Lord. God, that we would understand that you are worthy of all the praises. Father, we just praise your holy name. Just to bow down before your throne, see your face, I'll cry out, because you're holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Jesus, King of kings.
give it up for the Lord. Amen. I want to, before I get to my message, I want to share a couple of things with you. You can be seated. Can't feel free to shout a little bit with me. I, I've got my message ready and God messed me up last week. My intention is to get to this message in just a few moments, but I, um, if you don't know me very well, I'm, I'm pretty transparent about things. I may not share every detail with you about things that's going on in my life, but I want to tell you that being here has been the fight of my life. Has been a, it has been a struggle. But it's not because it's not where God wants me. It's because I'm where the enemy does not want me. Amen. I remember um, back years ago, 20 years or better, Chris and I, we had a pastor. And uh, he married us. He's actually a state overseer now. He, he went through like seven or eight surgeries like in a short time frame. You remember all them surgeries he had? And he always, he always said things about how it's just that struggle and things happening to him. And I have been, I'm telling you, the last couple of months, I have been in a spiritual struggle. Um, and it's because the enemy is pushing against me with everything he has. And I don't know why I'm sharing that with you. Maybe it's because you need to be praying. Maybe you need to be transforming. Maybe there's something going on there. And don't worry, I'm not a quitter. But it's been tough. But I can't help but think about how good God is today. David, and if you, you want to open your Bible, Psalm 124, it will not be on the screen because I did not give it to him. But he said, had it not been the Lord who was on our side. <laughs> had it not been the Lord who was on, let me read, I'll just read you the Psalm, it's not very long. He said, had it not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, had it not been the Lord who was on our side, men, when men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us alive. When their anger was kindled against us, then the waters would have engulfed us. The stream would have swept over our soul. Then the raging waters would have swept over our soul. Blessed be the Lord, who has not given us to the, be torn by their teeth. Our soul has escaped as a bird out of the snare of the trapper. The snare is broken and we have escaped. In verse 8 he says, Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. What a tremendous psalm from a tremendous individual who was not perfect, by the way. He, he dealt with some sin and some struggles and some different things in his life. But he'd been through enough to know when God had moved on his behalf. And so he makes this declaration. Did you know, we talk about Goliath, but you know that David killed a bear and a lion with his bare hands? Think about those battles. Most of us would tuck tail and run. But he fought that because he was protecting the sheep. It's a tremendous thing to think about. But David realizes that had it not been the Lord. What does that mean for us, though? Because so many times we look at people as our help and as our savior. For instance, most of the American church believes Donald Trump is their savior. Donald Trump's not your savior. He will never save America. There's only one Savior of America. His name is Jesus Christ, right? That's idolatry. No wonder he was removed from office. Now, Jermaine, y'all know Jermaine Decane. He struggled with it the last election. And uh, I told him, I said, Jermaine, what if God didn't want him there? He's like, what do you mean? I showed him some scripture. Scripture teaches us that God puts who he wants where he wants them, right? I said, why would God restore America, the church of America's greatest idol? Why would he do that? And he didn't. I know that's hard for some of you to swallow. But when I think about us, when I think about myself, there's so many times where we want to give credit to people. But David gives credit to God. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side. Listen, if I had to depend on Muhammad today, I would be in trouble. If I had to depend on Krishna or Gandhi or Buddha, I would be in big trouble. If I had to depend on you, I would be in big trouble. If you had to depend on me, 
you'd be in big trouble. Listen, I don't have to, it ain't about depending on my parents. It's not about being dependent on anybody else. If I had to depend on the Apostle Paul, I would be in trouble. But thanks be to God that it's Jesus Christ who's on my side. Amen. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, he raises a standard against him. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, it's a testimony. All of us have testimonies, and you could probably declare that today. I remember we went to Ohio, we, we didn't hardly have money to eat on. And it was a tough situation, it was a tough struggle as we were there. We were trying to do ministry, we were trying to do what, what we felt like God had called us to do, and, and we, we, but we made it through. And what's amazing about that journey, even though it was uncomfortable, is I can look back at it, and I can see the hand of God. And I can say, if it had not been the Lord who was on my side. Let me go ahead and tell you, he didn't make me a millionaire when I went to Ohio. He didn't give me a big house on a hill and a fancy car. He didn't. It was lonely. It was a struggle. But God gave us everything that we needed. And he used us in ministry there. He used us to make a difference in some people's lives. He used that ministry and everything that we did to help us. And it's a tremendous thing to look back and say, hey, I would have died in Ohio of starvation. I would have froze to death in Ohio if it wasn't for God. Let me, let me tell you what I mean by that. How I many know you got to have winter clothes in Ohio? You, you can't make it with a light jacket like you can in South Georgia. you got to have some long underwear. You got to have the whole nine yards because you will freeze to death. I mean, it is cold. And when it gets cold, it stays cold. And we paid our bills. We needed winter clothes. Didn't have money for winter clothes. Put it in God's hands. You know what happened? Didn't say this to nothing to nobody else. Just me and Kristen. Carson Anson were little. We got a card in the mail with a check for $500. And guess what the card said? This is for winter clothes. I'm telling you the truth. God provides every single time. And I think, where would we be if it had not been for the Lord? And David talking here about his enemies. He's talking about how God, if it had not been the Lord who was on his side, his enemies would have destroyed him. We have an enemy today who's trying to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants you dead. He wants you to surrender. He wants you to give up. He wants you to quit in this moment. But we get to remember that's why, that's why the psalm is here, because it helps us to remember that it's God that's on our side, and it's in his name where we get our help, and he's the one that made heaven and earth and everything else. What's there to fear when he's on our side? God is so good and so faithful. I'm going to move on into my message now. I wanted to share that. And I can keep going here. You'll hear a lot of testimonies from me about how God showed up and God done things. He's a tremendous God. Amen. And I'm grateful today. I don't have to depend on Donald Trump or Buddha or Muhammad or anybody else. I know you might hate me now. I don't care. <laughs> Acts chapter 2. A few weeks ago, I started the series, and I'm going to continue that series today. I feel like you need to hear this. I feel like we all need this. And we all need to grow in this. Okay? So Acts chapter 2, I'm, I'm going to read this and I'll come back and hit a few verses in it, uh, beginning in verse 41. It says, so then those who had, now remember, Peter has stood up on the day of Pentecost, he's preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. He proclaims one thing, Jesus. He don't tell them how to be blessed or prosperous, he tells them about Christ. He says, so then those who had received his word were baptized and that day were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had be believed were together and had all things in common. They began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, 
praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. What a powerful passage of Scripture. We, um, a couple weeks ago, I preached, started preaching on this a series called Devoted, and I talked about the Apostles' teaching. So let me remind you about the Apostles' teaching. Because it didn't have to do with health, wealth, and prosperity. The Apostles proclaimed one thing. Same thing Peter proclaimed on the day of Pentecost. It was Jesus. He didn't deliver a seven-step process for you to live a blessed life. He didn't write a book called The Blessed Life. He told people all about Jesus, everything that he said, everything he taught, everything he did. That's what the apostles taught, and that was the apostles' teaching. And for you and I, what we must do is revive the apostles' teaching and get back to the message of Christ. We have to have the message of Christ. And I want you to remember, they, the early church was devoted continually to the apostles' teaching. So unlike the American church that gets bored with hearing about Jesus... They grew more in love with him every time. So perhaps it's, maybe it's not just the message, maybe it's the preacher too. They talk all about Jesus. Can I tell you today that the apostles' teaching matters. It matters what we hear. Don't give me no fluff and marshmallows, give me Christ. Don't give me prosperity and wealth, give me Jesus. I want to hear about Christ. It's like Paul proclaimed to Corinthians, I shared this in the first sermon. Paul said, I, I, I claim to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's what it's all about. The apostles' teaching matters. And what the apostles' teaching is, is all about Jesus. I know we want to make it all about the Holy Ghost in the Pentecostal church. But you know what Jesus said about the Holy Ghost? He will testify about me. <laughs> well, we better hear that message. We want to run and dance and swing from chandeliers. We want to talk in tongues and put on a show, but it don't mean nothing if Christ is not in it. The message has to be Jesus. Has to be Jesus. And I don't want to hear any preacher tell me anything less than Christ. I want to hear Christ proclaimed. I told you a couple weeks ago the earmark of a true believer is devotion to God. In the church, we try to get people to be faithful to the church and faithful in tithing and faithful in attendance and faithful in serving. But if we never get people devoted to God, they'll never be faithful church members. They'll never do what they need to do. So the, the priority for us is to introduce people to a Jesus who loves them and a Jesus who died for them and a Jesus who is creator of everything. The divine Jesus. When the God of our churches is money, and this is the God of a lot of churches, even though people will deny that. I've had pastors say, oh, you've got you to preach a sermon to get people to give in the offering. I don't need you to get, to get you give an offering. I need to get you to Christ. That's what you need. It don't matter how much money you put in an offering. I know that's contrary to what you believe. It doesn't matter. How do I know that? Think about that widow with the two mites. The whole thing boils down to one, to one thing, me being devoted to him. And when I'm faithful in tithes, and I'm faithful in attendance, and I'm faithful in service, and I'm faithful in prayer, and I'm faithful to the apostles' teaching, it shows him my devotion to him. We make it about this, oh, if you give a hundred, God will give you a thousand. That's bull. That's not in the Bible. Oh, he'll give you a 30, 60, 100. You better find you somebody that knows scripture. You better find you somebody that's led by the Holy Spirit. Let them teach you what the Bible says. It's not about being rich. It's not about naming it and claiming it. It's about me giving up everything for him because he is worthy. That's what it's about. I got to get to my message. If you'll put verse 42 up there for me, Brother Anthony. Acts 2.42. So they, verse 42, there we go. So they continually devoting themselves. Remember, I told you a couple weeks ago, this means what he's saying here is they persevere in devoting themselves. That means when it ain't popular, they still devote themselves. When it's not fun, when it's miserable, when they don't feel like it, when people are talking about them, when people are coming against them, they still devote themselves to these four things. 
and the most successful church in all of history is that church. It ain't these auditoriums that seat 10,000 people. It's not. COVID proved that. You know what it's about? It's, these, these, this early church, they were devoted to Jesus. They were devote, devoted to his teachings. Look at this right here. I, I don't talk about fellowship today. They were devoted to fellowship. Now listen. They persevered in devoting themselves. They continued to devote themselves to fellowship. When it wasn't fun, when it wasn't convenient, they made a way to make sure they were continually devoting themselves to fellowship. So let's talk about fellowship this morning. So the Greek word here is koinonia. Koinonia has no English equivalent. That means we don't have a word in English that successfully defines for us what the word koinonia means. The closest thing we can do is throw this word called fellowship in here. Let me tell you what it means. It's powerful meaning. It means common life. That doesn't mean anything to us because we don't, we don't know what it means. We think common life means that we're all similar. That's not what it is. That's not what it is at all. It's life together. It's a shared life. Other words used to translate it in the New Testament are partnership. Depending on what translations you read, you'll find these words. Communion, sharing, words like that. They all are used to, to translate the word koinonia. But the Bible teaches us something that we don't hear a lot about. Matter of fact, we can be in koinonia with demons. We can be in koinonia with the wrong people. We can be in koinonia with our money, our time, our jobs, our political parties. We can be in koinonia with the wrong things. Or as Paul put it in Philippians chapter 3, I just want to be in fellowship with his sufferings. Koinonia with his sufferings. There's a lot of things we can be in koinonia with, and if we're not careful, we can be in koinonia with the wrong things. Like the Georgia Bulldogs. Don't get mad at me, Billy. <laughs> I'm serious, we, we have to be careful. It's not that we can't enjoy things and enjoy people. We have to make sure that what we're in fellowship with is things that are going to be that matters, that builds us, that helps us, because that's what God designed for us. He wants this for us. Let me give you, I'm just going to give you two little definitions, and both of these come from French Arrington. Everybody know who French Arrington is? A couple people? He is a premier New Testament scholar, and he is a Pentecostal. He teaches at Pentecostal Theological Seminary. He, this is what he defines, and this, is, this comes from his, his book, Spirit Anointed Church, which is a commentary on Acts. He said, joint participation at the deepest level in the spiritual fellowship that is in Christ. Then the very next page, he puts it this way. He says, one, by faith in Jesus Christ, in their fellowship with one another. It's a tremendous thing to think about, koinonia. It's important. It matters. How do I, why do I think it matters? Because the early church was devoted to it. So perhaps it, it, it's in our interest to learn what it is and make sure we're devoting ourselves to it. Because it matters. So the modern definition of fellowship in the modern church world is it has to be in a certain room, in a certain place in the church, and it has to be fried chicken and mashed potatoes, and biscuits, can't leave those biscuits out, right? That's what people view as fellowship. And, and there's so many people who, they don't fellowship in any other way except, and listen, that can be fellowship, there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not all coin and knee is, just to share a meal once every couple of months with fried chicken. And what's really bad is you'll go to a lot of churches, and you'll find people who are more devoted to the fried chicken than they are fellowship. It is true. I, man, Blanton Grove, we'd have a big day. We'd have fried chicken. Maybe I shouldn't say this on the live stream. I told them this, so it don't matter. I'd get to the altar call. Lost people in the house. And two-thirds of the church would get up and go line up for fried chicken. 
That's awful. I got in trouble with them for preaching against that too. I'm going to lie back. We believe it can only happen in these, these places at these certain times, but that's not what the early church did. They did it every day. They were devoted to it. And here's what leads me to this question. How many in here, and you ain't got to lift your hand, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, but how many in here go to church, or you come to church, but you're not part of the church? Point of need is being part of the church. Belonging. If that's you, that's not Christianity. That's not true Christianity. It's certainly not koinonia. That's a, a made in America mentality. And I hate to burst everybody's bubble, but everything made in America is not good. There's some junk made in America. They don't make, they don't make cars like they used to, Mr. Lonnie. They don't make them like what you got. They tear up fast. That's why I drive Toyota. I always get in trouble for saying that. Might as well throw it in here. I had a guy one time, he said, I can't believe you bought that farm-made truck. He was in the church, too. He said, my truck's more American-made than yours. I had to prove it to him. My truck's built in Texas. That's America with a capital M. Right? That's Ain't my fault that a Japanese company cares more about quality than an American company. Right? But we think that it's because it's made in America that it's right. But this idea of fellowship is an American-made tradition that doesn't line up with koinonia. Koinonia is about others. It's about others. Just like transformation. It's about other people. Koinonia is about me being concerned about what you need. By the way, this is God's design for the marriage, too. I don't know if you know that. Help meet. I mean, help meet your need. If you help meet my need, I help meet your need. Guess what? Nobody has needs. Same thing in the church. If we look out for our brothers and sisters in Christ and they look out for us, guess what? Everybody's needs are met. Koinonia is about others. I want to just teach you a little bit here because you can't properly study the New Testament, like it or not, I don't care if you like it or not, you can't study the New Testament without looking at the culture and the, and the society around the church. If you want to know what it means, you've got to look, you've got to look elsewhere. So I want to show you, I just want to get, share a couple of things with you. So if we want to talk about friendship, and this is this fellowship, this coin and all comes together in friendship, we have to look at what people believed around the church. There's a reason why Luke wrote it this way. There were philosophers, two famous ones that you know of, Plato and Aristotle. Y'all know heard of them. Let me tell you what Plato taught. And this influenced society, okay? Plato taught that self-interest must be demolished for the greater good of the whole. That means what I want has to go to the side. How I many know self gets in our way? Let me give you an example. Consumerism. Our nation's driven by it. Unfortunately, the church has become a place where it's driven by consumerism. Oh, let me give them what they want. Let me, let me give them what they, what they think they need. And so the, when consumerism gets involved, it's because of our selfish behaviors, which have to be crucified by Christ, right? They have to be crucified. That selfishness has to go. For koinonia to exist in the body, Self has to go. How I many of the Bible teaches us that? We die to self. Aristotle, he taught that there were three characteristics of a true friend. Number one, a true friend actively seeks for the good of their friend. They're always looking for what's best for their friend. Right? Self has to go to the side for that. Number two, they, they recognize of the good that one does on their behalf. So listen, you're looking out for the good of your friend, your friend's looking out for the good of you, and when they do good for you, you recognize it, and then number three, you pay back good for good. It's an interesting thought. It, it, this, is, this is the culture 
of the early church. This is what's around them in, in the, the Greek world, the, when the Hellenization and the Romans and everything going on. This is what they believed as a society. So it mattered. What was interesting, though, how many know that the church couldn't make the impact that it made if it was like everybody else? So the church wasn't like everybody else. The difference between the church and the world is that while the world were friends or in this fellowship with people just like them, white people with white people, rich people with rich people, poor people with poor people, black people with black people, Hispanics with Hispanics, the whole nine yards. They didn't cross over. However, the church done the exact opposite. They were in fellowship with anybody. Rich people with poor people, white people with black people. It didn't matter to them. Because the only thing that mattered was Christ. And Christ died for all. And so the church made a huge impact because they were different. They done things differently. They went beyond what the world, they went beyond what Plato said. They went beyond what Aristotle taught. They went beyond what everybody else believed. And the people stood there amazed at what they were seeing. In fact, if you do a little study of the Greek and everything that Luke is writing here, you know what you'll find out? Luke is presenting this as a miracle. He's saying, can you believe what God is doing in these people? Mixing races, mixing economic levels, they don't care. They're empowered by the Spirit to have koinonia with everybody that comes into the fellowship. That's why Paul taught us, no more Greek or Jew, no more slave or free, no more male or female. All of us become one when we get baptized into Christ. And that's what the early church did. And because they did what they did, everybody was amazed. Acts chapter 2, I want to read Verses 44 through, I'll just read through 47 again. Because koinonia is not just a word that we can just put over here and look at. It's a way of life. Koinonia is proof to what God can do and what God wants to do. Remember, it's about sharing. It's about, it's about common life. It's a, it's, it's a tremendous thing, and it's foreign to us. I know it is. Acts chapter 2, verse 44 and like I said, Luke is presenting this like it's a miracle. Can you believe what God is doing? We shout about healing, but we don't shout about fellowship and koinonia. This right here is what gets me up in the morning. This is what I want to see as a pastor. I don't care about big buildings and fancy cars. I don't care about that. I care about doing what God has called me to do and leading a people to this by the power of the Holy Spirit. All those who had believed, I mean, that's key, you got to believe. They were together, and they had all things, that, remember, it's not just a word, it's a way of life. So their way of life is defining koinonia. They were together, had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have a need. Let me tell you what's happened. The rich people were selling stuff to help the poor people. It's tremendous. White people were helping black people, and black people were helping. I mean, this is the church. This is what God designed. Not for a white church here and a black church there. That's not God's design. We are one. Day by day. Go ahead and say this in your mind. Say every day. Every day. Continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. Do you get this? It wasn't, a, it wasn't a, the apostles' teaching that had favor with all the people. You know why? Because they rejected that. But they sit back amazed because of what was happening in the church. For the first time they're seeing this, this, this pool of people 
from all different backgrounds and walks, Jews with Gentiles. I said, no, no. This is new. How is this happening? The Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. What a tremendous testimony to what God was doing. Now let me tell you this real quick because in the Greek, in, in the Greek language, they don't, they don't need all the words we need. They, matter of fact, most preachers that will look in a lexicon and give us a, a definition to the root word. However, a lot of the meaning for what we're reading doesn't just come from that root word. It comes from the, the prefixes, the, the beginning and the end of the word. They add those things in, and with one or two words, they can give you a whole paragraph just about. The Greeks don't need all we need. And so Luke is using, when he talks about koinonia, he's using a prefix in, this, in his writing that doesn't just reveal to us what God is doing or what God wants to do. He reveals to us the importance of a bond. A bond. Colossians chapter 3. Anybody know what the perfect bond of unity is? Love. So Luke is, he is, he is emphasizing the bond of unity, the bond of koinonia, the bond that holds everybody together regardless of class, regardless of race, regardless of gender. And it's love. Paul says it this way, and I, I preached this a few weeks ago. He says, so as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Love is what holds us together. Love, special love, a love for one another. How many know you'll never develop a love for one another sitting on the pew and not fellowshipping? You won't. You, you, you'll be right there. You'll be a stranger to people. They'll be a stranger to you. And you'll never develop a love enough for them that will hold you together. That's why people find it so easy to bounce from church to church. We have, to, we have to have that devotion. We have to have that time together. We have to have fellowship. We have to be around one another to build love for one another. Oh, it's easy for us to say, oh, I love everybody. That's hogwash. How many people are you going to sell your house for if they need something? That's, that's love, right? That, that's, that's real love that most of us have no idea about. And the only way we're going to learn that love is by the power of God. Because Paul tells us in Romans 5 that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. But that's love. That's what it looks like. And that's what God's design is. And that design works. They, they turned their whole known world upside down for Jesus Christ. Oh, sure, some of them was martyred. But here we are, 2,000 years later, still the church. Still the church. And it's because of their bond, and their koinonia that kept it going. And if you read Acts, you'll find some amazing things. Like in Acts chapter 12, Peter and James are arrested, and James is killed, and Peter's in jail. And what do we find the church doing? Praying. Praying. And, and the angel comes, and he wakes Peter up. They're going to kill Peter. It's a sure thing. As soon as the Passover is over with, they got an a, a opportunity. They're going to kill him. The angel comes, wakes him up, leads him out of the jail. Peter shows up at the house where the church is praying, and a girl answered the door, and she didn't even believe it was him. Tremendous. But they cared. They loved Peter. They loved one another. So here's the American mentality. What's in it for me? What's in it for me? That's a horrible mentality. It doesn't belong in the church. However, there is something in it for you. Let me tell you what koinonia means for you. It means there's somebody who's in fellowship with you and they're willing to share with you and they're willing to pray for you and they love you and they want to encourage you and they want to strengthen you. They want to help you. That's what koinonia means for you. It also means that you get to do that for someone else. 
tremendous. Discipleship requires fellowship. I don't care what some crazy internet Christian says that sits at home and refuses to go be a part of organized religion. I don't care what they say. Discipleship requires fellowship because iron sharpens iron. We help one another. We grow with one another. We strengthen one another. We get on to one another. Right? It, this thing is beautiful. So discipleship requires fellowship. It requires worship. It requires study. It requires prayer. It requires service. It requires celebration. And that list could go on and on and on. And all of those things are corporate duties of the church. You know why? We belong together. That's God's design. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't choose to participate in the fellowship of the church. Listen, we got a lot of opportunities of fellowship. A lot of opportunities to build relationship and love for one another. And hopefully a lot more come. But the enemy has effectively caused so many Christians to believe that they don't need fellowship. A lot, of, a lot of Christians believe that. And it's really a sad thing. But I want you to know there's a reason why the enemy doesn't want you to fellowship. And it's the same reason he don't want you to pray. Same reason he don't want you to worship. And the same reason he don't want you to come to the altar. And the same reason he don't want you at church. There's a reason why he gives us so many excuses to not show up. We got good at that. Now listen, I'm not talking about when you sit. I'm not, I'm not preaching again. Sometimes that's just the way it is. But you know as well as I do, there's been times you could have went, but you used a little mild headache to get out of it. Right? We've all done that. I made somebody mad one time. And he's like, I don't feel like it. I'm talking about going to church. I said, but Jesus didn't feel like getting on that cross. But he did it. But the enemy wants you to stay to yourself. He wants you to sit there bitter and grouchy and alone because that's where he'll kill you. I mean, it's not good for a sheep to, to stagger from the, from the herd. See, Jesus, he gave a parable in Luke 15 about the good sh the shepherd going after the one lost sheep, leaving the 99. You know why he can do that? Because the 99 is going to be okay as long as they stay together. They'll survive for a little bit. But that one sheep out there by himself, he's nothing but prey. And as soon as the enemy gets a, a sniff of, of that one sheep, he's going to pounce and he's going to have lunch. So it's so important for that shepherd to leave the 99 and go after the one because the one by itself will die most certainly. Oh, he's got to come back to the 99 because sheep are dumb. They are. That's one of the dumbest animals if you do some research on it. They can't even find water to drink, Brother Wayne. They got to have a shepherd lead them to water. They dumb. So he's got to come back to them. But the urgency is let me go after that one because if I don't go after that one, he's not going to make it. It's a tremendous thought. And it also reveals to us why the enemy wants us to not fellowship and not be a part and not find koinonia with other Christians. It's bigger than a meal in the fellowship hall. The early church would not have made it without being devoted to koinonia. You won't either. You won't. You're going to get beat up every time when you're by yourself. How many of you feel better when you're around a group of people and you talk about scripture and have a good time? That's all of us. You know why? Because we need one another. God doesn't need us, but we need him and we need one another. And God has designed this perfect thing. It's not a perfect thing, but it's his perfect design called the church. And it's bigger than the, these walls of this building. It's bigger than this carpet or the pews. It's bigger than Sunday morning. It's everyday lifestyle. And we can live in fellowship with one another. You need fellowship. The church needs fellowship. Fellowship matters. It matters. It matters. And it's a sad time we live in because a lot of, over the last 20 or 30 years, the church's culture has developed to 
Well, if you ain't having church on Sunday night, you're going to go to hell. I, I, I challenged Blank Grove one time. We got rid of Sunday nights. Uh, COVID ended it. I think it did the same thing here. I challenged them. I said, I got a $100 bill for anybody. And at the time, I'd been there about six years. For anyone that can name five sermons I preached on a Sunday night. I had no takers on that. You know what it showed? You coming in and listening to a sermon has some benefits, but it's not the most important thing that we do as a body. There's a lot more things. We're going to preach the word, but we can preach the word whether it's in somebody's living room or if it's in a fellowship meal in there. We can preach the word everywhere we go, and that's what matters. Koinonia matters. Fellowship matters. If you'll stand with me. Over the years, fellowship has become a hard thing for some people. And the reason for that is because of cancerous things going on in the church, like gossip and slander. Matter of fact, I'll, just, I'll be transparent real quick again. There is, I, can, I can count on less than one hand the Church of God preachers that I would share anything with. You know why? Because they're like ravenous wolves, a lot of them. Oh, man, if we can get this out there, overseer, get rid of him, and I can go there. You get this mentality going on. I was at a, a surgery one time. I, lo I love this preacher. I mean, he's a friend. I, I wouldn't tell him anything. But uh, regardless, I was at a surgery one time for 15 hours for a little girl who had to have brain surgery. She had cancer. She's alive and well. Um, she's doing great. It's been years ago, but um, there were several churches involved, including mine. I was there. There were several other preachers there. And uh, throughout the day, several of them just kind of drifted off, had things to go do, which is understandable. I sat there 15 hours. But about eight, And I got there 6 o'clock that morning or something. Come 8 o'clock that night, I'm sitting there by myself. I was reading or doing something. And I hear this Church of God preacher, that's what he said. I'm the only preacher that cares enough to stay here. I promise you, this is a true story. One of the ladies, and she didn't come to my church, but I served with her at, at Unity. She said, Brother Josh is still here. And his eyes got so big. That, that's the kind of thing we deal with in church. When people, they, they want to hear your business and go and talk and spread some rumor. No wonder we don't want to open up and share. And if you do that to people, you need to repent this morning. You need to turn to Christ. You sit back and are judgmental about everything. Remember what I told you last week? Paul said, don't let anyone act as your judge. Your role is not to judge people, but to help people. Be in fact, love them enough to say, I know you're struggling with this, but I'm going to help you. That's what it's all about. And so I know the struggle sometimes of opening up to people. But I promise you, as the shepherd, if you share something with somebody and they share it with everybody else, you come tell me. I will deal with it. Because that is cancer in the body of Christ. And there ain't a person here, if you got diagnosed with cancer, unless you were just ready to go be with the Lord, that you would ignore it and just let it have its toll. So I'm asking you today is not just to trust everybody else, but to trust God. This is God's design. And I want to invite you to this altar. Maybe you need to repent for, for causing harm to people. Maybe you need to God to help you to be able to open up to people. We need koinonia. We need fellowship in the body. It's going to make us stronger. And who knows what tomorrow holds. We need one another. Listen, we got some strong groups in the church, and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for that. But we need more. Come find your place in the altar. Father, we love you so much. I thank you, Lord, for the example, Lord, that you have set for us. I thank you for your design, your creation. Lord, that we call the church. We are the body of Christ. 
And Lord, we need coin of knee. And I pray, God, that as, as this church advances the kingdom, God, that our fellowship together would grow and grow and grow. Let us build love, Lord, which is the perfect bond of unity. Lord, let us take the gospel to every creature together. Let us share everything we have with each other together. Let us move together. Let us live together. Let us do everything you've called us to do together. Because koinonia matters. Fellowship in the body of Christ, it matters, God. And I pray, God, for every person here. Lord, if there's someone here that doesn't, they don't do fellowship, they don't like fellowship, I pray, Lord, that you would give them a desire to fellowship, a desire to build relationship, a desire to grow the bond that holds us together. I pray, Lord, right now for your divine will to be done in this house. We give you glory for all that you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Give myself away. Oh, my life.
Our pastor said that the enemy is coming against him and his family. God put in my spirit that we anoint him and pray for him and his family today. We're finna lay hands on our pastor. We finna rebuke the enemy because God sent him here for this time and this present. And we're going to anoint him today and his wife. And if you feel led to come and stand around them this morning, if not, you, lead, you, you, you stretch your hand this way. But I'm telling you today, we take authority over that thing that has come against our pastor and his wife and his family. And we speak life and we speak right now in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you right now in the power of the Holy Ghost. Right now we come before you and we speak life and we speak word over this family, God. You send him to us, Father. We pray right now in the name of Jesus, we speak against the enemy. You are a liar and there is no truth in you. You see the word that our pastor preaches. You see the the belief that he has on his word. And we speak right now life over his family. We speak life over this church. We speak life over that that you have said before us in the name of Jesus. We pray right now, Father God, and ask you, Lord, to anoint him. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we speak blessing. We speak anointing. Devil, you're a liar, and we call you that as such in the name of Jesus. We, we speak to that and tell you to be gone in the name of Jesus. Father, you see what's happening here. You see the presence that is being brought and being, you see the word that is being preached. You see the things that is being brought forth and being spoken to. And we believe it and we claim it in the name of Jesus. We pray, God, right now that you have your way in this house. We pray right now, God, that you have your way in this community. We speak right now, God, and we claim that those that are. Father, we speak right now and ask in the Right now in the name of Jesus, Father, I pray you anoint him. Right now in the name of Jesus, I pray you cover him. Right now in the name of Jesus, I pray you protect him. Father, we stand in front of him, God. Father, we stand in front of him. We, 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 we stand in the, in, in the way of the enemy, God. We protect him. God, we stand and claim him, God. We claim him as yours, God. We claim him right now in the name of Jesus. And we believe it, God. We believe it. In the name of Jesus, we declare it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Church, just praise him today. Church, just praise him like you've never praised him before. God wants to do a thing in this house. God wants to do a thing in this community. And we stand before the devil right now in the name of Jesus and declare him gone. We stand before him right now and claim Jesus Christ. Father, you're worthy to be praised today. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I give myself, I give myself to you, Lord. My life is not my own to you.
Thank y'all so much. Listen, I got these two uh, clipboards down here, um, and we're going to do a book for couples. If you're interested in doing this, we're going to probably going to do five sessions. I hadn't got them scheduled yet, um, but the book's called Men Are Like Waffles, Women Are Like Spaghetti, and it, it teaches us our differences because couples have a hard time sometimes remembering that their spouse is different than they are and thinks different and does things different, and so um, it's a very important book. It's a Christian book. It's, it's comical, it's easy to read, you want to have fun with it. So please come sign up for that. I'm, I'm doing that where I know how many books I need. I've got 15 already, but if I need to get some more, I will. Um, and also, our connected group, we're going to the Okoe, going to Whitewater Raft in July. And uh, we want, want you to come and be a part of that. And i got to reserve rooms. So if you're not sure, but you want to go, sign up anyway. I can cancel the room later, but I may not be able to add a room if they get booked. So um, sign up, even if you're not real sure, but you want to do it. Um, but we want you to come. The dates on that is July the 25th through the 27th. We'll do a Thursday night, Friday night, come back Saturday. And it's going to be a, a fantastic. I was going to do a Braves game on the way up, but we'd have to do a big detour to New York to see a Braves game. So that's not going to happen. Um, but maybe we can find something else to get into. But uh, please sign up for those of you interested in either one of those. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, and Wednesday night, 630. Listen, we're going to talk about, we're going to answer the question, is Jesus the only way? Okay, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about religious plurality, and that's the modern belief that there's a whole bunch of different paths to God. Uh, so we'll talk about all that stuff. It's going to be good. Don't miss it. We love you. Have a blessed week.